Let's start this talk off with an epigraph from John Ashbery, who <clears throat> writes, Here in the museum, we do not invite trouble, only establishment woes, sort of. The first thing I'd like you to notice tonight is the door uh, of the museum that you entered. It's the back door. Most people don't know that such an entrance exists. Go any day to MoMA and uh, look at the 53rd Street entrance. You go into the lobby, you can't move. But on that same day, try the back door. It's completely empty, perhaps with the exception of a few groups of noisy school children. Now, notice that just outside of this auditorium uh, is a gallery. And this gallery, in my opinion, is one of the liveliest galleries in all the museum. You never know what you're going to run into here. Uh, I recall one time the gallery transformed entirely into what looked like a replica of a 19th century rural country store, which turned out to be this full-scale replica of J. Morgan Pewitt's upstate residency and studio. She transformed the entire space. It was amazing. Another time I encountered a group of people sharing a meal on a rug that they had just communally hand-knit. It's always active, filled with people doing things, and for all the lip service paid to relational aesthetics in the art world, it seems like socially related activities are happening here every day. After all, this is the wing of public programs, education, research, and libraries. People is what they do best. The uh, exhibitions held here often feature books and ephemera culled from the archives of the MoMA Library. And in 2010, the MoMA Library mounted the very first show devoted to the outsider poet Bern Porter in this very gallery. Porter was originally a scientist who worked on the secret Manhattan Project, whose mission was uh, unknown to even those working on it. When it was revealed to him, he was horrified, and it turned him into a lifelong pacifist and devotee of the arts. For the rest of his life, he was involved with a parade of major figures of 20th century American art and literature. While living on the West Coast in the 1940s, he published risque works by and about Henry Miller, like this poetry anthology from 1945. A decade later found him running a gallery that showed then unknown Bay Area figurative painters like Richard Diebenkorn. After several decades of drifting around the world, he finally turned, uh, returned back to his ancestral home of Belfast, Maine, where he worked as a publisher, poet, and performer until his death in 2004, putting out scores of self-published pamphlets, broadsheets, cassettes, and chapbooks. And uh, these are some of the examples uh, of his found poems, where he recontextualizes, re recontextualizes pages cut out of commercial sources, phone books, magazines, mail order catalogs. And by the time he died, he was a legendary figure. He was sort of a cult figure. You could say he could be compared to someone like Kenneth Anger, wildly brilliant, widely influential, and little known to the larger world. Now, how did Bern Porter get his works into the MoMA Library? through the same door, metaphorically speaking, that you entered through, the back door. Because back in the 70s, the MoMA librarian, Clive Philippot, devised a brilliant scheme whereby anybody could have their works officially acquired by the Museum of Modern Art if they mailed stuff to the library. And once word got out, the museum began getting sent boatloads of ephemera, mail, correspondence art, zines, concrete poetry, cassette tapes, scribbling, samizat publications, broadsides, all sorts of unofficial culture made its way this way into the museum's collection. Now, sometimes the back door was used to get artworks into the front door exhibitions, and this happened in 1991 when Chuck Close was asked to curate an artist's choice show. And Close decided to choose a selection of portraits from MoMA's collection, and he wanted to include Ray Johnson, who at the time, unbelievably enough, was still not actually in MoMA's collection. Ray Johnson was not in MoMA's collection as of 1991. It's a mind-boggling thought. So to get himself into the collection, Johnson stuffed this funky photocopy cartoon of William de Kooning into an envelope and mailed it off to Philippot at the library. 
And sure enough, it was entered into the collection of MoMA with the credit line, Gift of the Artists, the Museum of Modern Art Library Special Collections, therefore eligible to be included in Chuck Close's front door show. Amazing story, isn't that? Um, like everyone else, Burn Porter began sending crates of his stuff here, and it sat dormant for 30 years until Rachel Morrison, who I uh, thanked before, who was uh, here at the MoMA Library, began sifting through it, finally mounting a large exhibition. It was a radical, eye-opening, and inspiring show, and it reminds me of, of the show that, of, 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 of Zines and Mimeo, A Secret Location on the Lower East Side that Steve Clay did at the New York City Public Library. But unlike Steve's show, sadly, few people saw this show that Rachel did. There were no reviews of it. It was like every other show mounted in this backdoor space, by and large ignored. So not long after the MoMA show, Porter's seminal book, uh, 1972 book, Found Poems, which I showed earlier, uh, the original cover from Something Else Press, this time was reissued by uh, Nightboat Books here in New York, a small press, with a foreword written by none other than David Byrne, the founder, of course, if you don't know, of the influential band The Talking Heads. Now, Byrne elegantly traces and contextualizes the lineage of Porter's found poems, citing Jerome Rothenberg's collection of data, of data and Native American texts from the 60s and 70s, the uh, great graphic novels of Quentin Fiore, or graphic books, I should say, and Marshall McLuhan, and, of course, Warhol's ephemeral products of the Silver Factory as being essential to historically understanding and, his, and situating Porter's uh, works. Byrne talks about how he was inspired to write after encountering the works of Byrne Porter, telling how in the early 70s, after dropping out of art school, he transcribed a complete broadcast, David Byrne transcribed a complete broadcast of the game show, The Price is Right, commercials and all. And Byrne says, quote, the idea that holding this stuff, for, uh, this stuff up for examination might yield something was in the air at that time. Leaving it raw and unfiltered just seemed the way to go. It simply meant to say, this is here. I continued making lists and questionnaires around the same time I was beginning to write songs. Obviously, I was ready to receive this stuff. Now, it's wonderful to think that Byrne Porter had a hand in shaping something as huge as the talking heads, right? But this is the secret way that culture flows. Connections are made through the underground, through back doors, and long after these ideas are digested, they enter triumphantly through the front door, applauded by the directors, the curators, and the trustees. But these ideas always begin at the back door. Now, my interactions with MoMA as a poet have always been through the back door. I've done several readings here over the years, and these days poetry always, uh, I'm sorry, poetry at MoMA never happens through the front door. It's always let in through the back door via the modern poet series that Laura Bayless, who you just heard speak, has been running here since 2006. And during that time, she's had over 50 poets to read uh, in in, uh, in this auditorium. And it's not just experimental or emerging poets who come through this back door. I recall seeing a reading in this very uh, auditorium that included the former U.S. poet laureate Robert Pinsky. And Robert Pinsky entered through the same door as did Stephen Zoltansky, a 31-year-old emerging experimental poet when he was part of a reading here last year. Now, when I first got to MoMA, one of the projects I considered doing was to padlock the front door, <laughs> forcing people to enter through the back door, right, for, for a day. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> Just so they know it. But I figured that's already happening on its own. So this is really a lecture about how the back door is becoming the front door and by, do, and by doing so is challenging institutions in the way that they're structured. And it has a lot to do with the changes brought on by the digital age, but it has its grounding in, many, in any number of modernist strategies, uh, including deconstruction, institutional critique, radical poetics, and conceptual art. And tonight I'll be tracing a subjective history discussing these changes and situations that I've somehow witnessed from being on the insides 
of these major institutions. And while it's primarily about my interactions with institutions as a poet, I think the lessons and stories can be pretty much applied across the board as being representative of broad cultural shifts that many fields are experiencing right now. But let me just preface by saying that as poets, we have really nothing to lose. It's an outlaw business. It's our obligation to cause trouble, to identify and rub salt into open wounds, to be unruly guests at the party, saying things we oughtn't. And why? Because we can. And because poetry has no economic value, it's liberated from the orthodoxies and the politenesses that constrain just about every other form of art. As such, it's obliged to take chances to be as experimental, to be as innovative as it possibly can be, because poetry is bulletproof in its weakness and its powerlessness, like a perfume or a fart or a body odor slithering between the cracks of a wall. Poetry wafts under shut doorways and stealthily sneaks through the back door unnoticed because nobody really pays attention to it. It dons a sort of invisibility cloak, free to go where it wants and when it wants. Poetry doesn't need you. It doesn't require your permission to exist. It doesn't care if you love it or not. It's marvelously illegitimate and proudly fraudulent. The whole endeavor, quite frankly, is a farce. It doesn't need institutional support. After all, it proceeds perfectly well without it. It requires no money, no funding, no backers, no consensus, no ass-kissing, no political compromises. All the money in the world can't make a better poem or a better book of poems. Great books are being published all the time without any money whatsoever, and more poetry than can ever be published is being written each and every day. And when the biggest publishing houses, for some reason, decide to publish poetry, they always lose money on it. And yet this is why poetry is important, because poetry today occupies the position that conceptual art once held in the art world. Conceptual art was, in its inception, an act of resistance, one that through dematerialization called into question the status of the unique art object and the privilege of the sole author. It proposed that art could be made by anyone, regardless of their skill set. And it also claimed that art could have democratic distribution systems able to be experienced by all. Of course, we know today that conceptual art has been thoroughly integrated into the canon of art history and has acquired great monetary value. This place is full of it. And yet, its original utopian ethos lives on, continuing to provide much-needed framework, strategies of resistance, and roadmaps for our increasingly dematerialized and radically democratic digital world. Now, one such strain of conceptual art is known as institutional critique, which takes subject matter, which takes, I'm sorry, as its subject matter, the way that institutions frame and control discourses surrounding the artworks that they exhibit, rather than focusing on the content of the artworks themselves. A more traditional approach, of course, would be to isolate a work of art and appreciate its aesthetic values while ignoring the context in which it's being displayed and the factors that brought it there. Institutional critique claims that the structures surrounding the work are actually what gives the work its meaning, oftentimes controlling the reception of a work in ways that we as viewers are unaware of. While institutional critique began in the museum, the practice evolved over time to include everything from the production and distribution of art to an examination of the corporate offices or collectors' homes where the art was hung. By the 80s, it roped in art criticism, academic lectures, and arts reception in the popular press. Around the same time, art schools began offering classes in post-studio practice where the studying of institutional critique became an act of making art in and of itself. And so you get works like this, which is Hans Hacke's 1970 uh, MoMA poll, which was literally a poll that asked viewers, would the fact that Governor Rockefeller has not denounced Richard Nixon's Indochina policy be a reason for your not voting for him in November? And then they provided two plexiglass boxes into which the yes or no ballots were cast. 
while aesthetically the piece fit into the primary structures and information-based art of the period, Hacke meant to shed light really on the fact that Nelson Rockefeller was a member of MoMA's board, thereby making visible the normally hidden play of money, power, and politics behind the institution. Another tactic is to take uh, uh, objects from a museum's collection and rearrange them in ways that highlight the biases of that collection. So in this piece here in 1993, the African-American artist Fred Wilson critiqued the Maryland Historical Society's collection in relationship to Maryland's history of slavery. For this show, he regrouped specific objects from the museum in order to speak of history which the museum and the community wouldn't talk about, the history of the exclusion and abuse that African American people experienced in that area. Other works have focused on the physical institution itself. This is Andrea Frazier acting as a docent leading a group at a Philadelphia museum, uh, at, at the Philadelphia Museum on false tours, not of the works on the walls, but of the security systems, water fountains, and in this case, she's deconstructing the cafeteria. <laughs> in 2003, Fraser performed what was perhaps the ultimate work of institutional critique. A collector paid $20,000 to sleep with her, not for sex, according to Fraser, but to make an artwork. And yet, surprisingly, Institutional critique has its roots in poetry, or rather a poet's disenchantment with his career trajectory. In 1964, Marcel Broders, an impoverished poet associated for many years with the la radical left wing of the Belgian Surrealist movement, took 44 unsold copies of his last volume of poetry. He embedded them in plaster and then represented them as a sculpture in a gallery. With this one gesture, he symbolically annulled his career as a writer by rendering his already economically worthless, worthless books now completely unreadable, and at the same time, by recontextualizing them, recontextualizing them as art, gave license to magically transform them into commodifiable art objects. By prioritizing cultural context over artistic content, Broder's gesture is generally considered to be the first work of institutional critique. The first time he showed these plaster-embedded books, Broders released a statement which made explicit his intentions. He said, quote, I too wondered whether I could not sell something and succeed in life. For some time, I'd been no good at anything. I'm 40 years old. Finally, the idea of inventing something insincere crossed my mind, and I set to work straight away. Now, there's something prescient about Broder's practice as to much work that's been staged in the poetry world recently, with the emergence of conceptual poetics, the possibilities for critical, self-reflexive devices have become somewhat commonplace. These two keywords that Broder used, unreadability and insincerity, are words that you often hear batted around poetry today. In fact, you could say that two recent poetry movement, uh, conceptual writings, unreadability, and Flarf's insincerity, are founded upon and enact these exact premises. Yet the idea of creating books that aren't somehow meant to be read, but instead act as triggers for discourses that lay far outside the page or the reading experience, point to something that's increasingly happening with cultural artifacts in the digital world. We seem to be less interested in interacting with them as content. Rather, we treat them more like objects or containers that could be filled with anything or nothing. And by doing so, we've all become en masse archivists and librarians. And when we choose to share our digital artifacts on social networking or blogs, we take on the additional role of educators, eager to share what we know with everyone that we know. By extension, I think it's fair to say that most of us today spend as much time organizing our vast collections of media than we actually do interacting with them. Most of us have more music on our hard drives than we'll ever be able to listen to, and yet we keep getting more. I spend much more time acquiring, cataloging, and archiving my artifacts these days than I actually do engaging with them, suggesting to me that the ways in which culture is distributed and archived has become profoundly more intriguing than the cultural artifact itself. What we've experienced is an inversion of consumption, one which we've come to engage in a more profound way with the acts 
of acquisition over that which we are acquiring. We've come to prefer the bottles to the wine. This then could be proposed as a form of institutional critique of artifacts and the way that they circulate in the digital world. And you take Boing Boing, for instance. They're one of the most powerful blogs on the web, but they don't create anything. Rather, they filter the morass of information and pull up the best stuff. The fact of Boing Boing pointing or linking to something far outweighs the thing to which they are linking. The new creativity, then, is pointing, not making. Likewise, in the future, the best writers will be the best information managers. Now, these ideas have led to a reconfiguration of our sense of the physical world as well, as best expressed by the phenomena that's recently come to be known as the new aesthetic, which articulates the mapping of the digital world onto the physical one, not content to live exclusively on the screen. Memes, images, and ideas born of digital culture are infiltrating and expressing themselves in meat space. You think of the pixelated uh, 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 camouflage known as Digicam as a, as, as a handy example. This slight warping of reality at once familiar and disconcerting represents a paradigmatic shift in the ways that we process aesthetics, leading writer Bruce Sterling to say, quote, look at those images objectively. Scarcely one of those things in there would have made any sense to anyone in 1982 or even in 1992. Perhaps of those times, people of those times would have not known what they were seeing with these new aesthetic images. The new aesthetic embraces hybrid strategies, casting aspersions on artistic practices perpetuated within and contingent upon self-sustaining cloistered environments. New notions of distribution come into play as well. Those practices that are based on uniqueness and singularity, such as the art market, which is increasingly beginning to resemble an antique shop these appear headed for obsolescence. Likewise, sealed off invented worlds like Second Life and virtual reality are giving way to integrated terrestrial cyber hybrids such as geotagging and augmented reality. Aligning the new aesthetic with long-standing media-based documentarian practices such as Warhol, Candid Camera, In American Family, Reality Television, Sasha Baron Cohen. This is a strain in which, proclaim, uh, which proclaims real life, reframed and recontextualized, as more creative, invented, or twisted than anything we could possibly conjure up in our fictive imaginations. And just think of the promotional Google Glasses video that everyone's seen. The live stream now is on 24-7. We are really just at the beginning of this. One way of historically contextualizing this phenomena might be through Marcel Duchamp's concept of the infra-thin. A state between states, Duchamp describes the infra-thin as the warmth of a seat which has just been left. Or velvet trousers, their whistling sound in walking by. Brushing of the two legs is an infra-thin separation signaled by sound. Like an electronic current, the infrathin hovers and pulses, creating a dynamic stasis, referring, refusing to commit to one state or another. The 21st century is invisible. The surface of things is the wrong place to find the 21st century. Instead, the unseen, the infrathin, those tiny devices in our pockets or the thick data haze which permeates the air we breathe, those are the things that locate us in the 21st century present. And in this way, the new aesthetic is not so much a movement as it is a marker, a moment of observation which informs us that culture, along with its means of production and reception, has radically shifted beneath our feet while we were looking the other way. <laughs> the uh, inventor of this uh, issue one happens to be in the room, hence my nod at him. 
If in fact we're witnessing a swapping of content for distribution, then the most relevant work of institutional critique in the poetry world to date is now the infamous issue one. Published in 2008, it was a 3,785 page unauthorized and unpermissioned an anthology, quote, written by 3,164 poets whose poems were actually authored not by the poets to whom they were attributed. Instead, the poems were generated by a computer which randomly synced each author with a poem. Stylistically, it made no sense. A well-known traditional poet, let's say, was paired with a radically disjunctive modernist poem penned by a computer and vice versa. Yet it wasn't so much the stylistics that raised the eyebrows, it was the mechanics of it, the distribution and the notification which riled the contributors. The work was stitched together into a large PDF which was placed on a media server late one evening, and many people found out about their inclusion the first thing in the morning when finding that the Google alert they had set for their name had notified them, in fact, that they were included in a major new anthology. <laughs> And clicking on the link brought them to the anthology where upon downloading it, they found their name attached to a poem they didn't write. Like wildfire, the reaction spread through the community. Why was I in it? Why wasn't I in it? Why was my name matched with that poem? Who was responsible for this anarcho flarf vandalism, as one critic put it? While some of the, quote, contributors were, decided, were delighted to be included, and some of them went so far as to include their poem uh, in their next volume of poetry <laughs> under their own name, others were wildly angered. As there really wasn't much to discuss about the poems in regard to everything else going on about this gesture, they seem pretty irrelevant. We were forced to consider the, con the conceptual apparatuses uh, that the anonymous authors had set into motion. With one gesture, like Marcel Broder's, they had switched the focus from content to context. Content to context. In April of 2001, the critic Robert uh, Archambault wrote of my own work. He said, quote, there are points, especially lately, where Goldsmith seems to be going in a direction like a lot of what he does, which has already been taken before in the art world, but has been less common in the poetry world. It's a turn to the idea of the career itself as the most important medium of the art. There are plenty of ways to go about this, but the way Goldsmith seems to be going about it is one that people who are critical of the apparatus of fame, the market and cultural capital and symbolic goods, and the construction of status might find disconcerting. Goldsmith distances himself from the idea of text as object and moves toward the effect, the stimulation of thought, and the general conversation about the object as the real medium of his art. It's not quite the artist's career as the artist's medium, but it's a step in that direction. It's a direction I personally see as a bit what? Uh, I suppose destined to produce unhappiness for those who take it is the phrase, end quote. Now, while I'm curious as to how a perfect stranger might be able to predict my future mental state, Archambault's uh, skepticism is typical of the unexamined reaction that the poetry world often falls back upon when they suspect poets of engaging with institutions on any level. But with little interest in avant-garde writing in the general population, if not for institutions, my work and many of my peers' work would be nearly invisible. So you have the institution as survival strategy. In fact, for advanced poetries, meaning the ones that are decidedly non- or anti-populist, if this work isn't received in the academy, it's not received at all. If my work isn't being taught or written about, it really doesn't exist because there is no readership. With this historical knowledge over the years, as various mainstream institutions such as this one has reached out to support it, uh, Ivy League universities, well-funded liter literary journals and academic journals, major museums, even the White House, I said yes, but with a caveat. I couldn't be censored and had to be allowed to say what I needed to say, the way I needed to say it, or I would walk away, uh, no matter how distasteful the things I was saying to them. And believe me, I say some very... Uh, distasteful things. So an engagement with an institution can be like holding a mirror up to that institution, a limit test to see what the institution is capable of or incapable of. But these old attitudes die hard. 
The poetry world was largely critical of my acceptance of an invitation to read at the White House in May of 2011, most prominently articulated by the poet and blogger Lynn Din, who claimed, quote, to be a minstrel for a mass murderer is nothing to be proud of. This just heightens my contempt for the state of American poetry. Did Bertolt Brecht dance for Hitler? Future generations will look back at us and wretch. Very sad. And yet the institution, in the form of Al Filres of the University of Pennsylvania, my employer, leapt to my defense. The institution leapt to my defense with a nuanced and moderate argument. And he responded to Din. And I'll quote uh, Al at length here. Al says, I don't disagree with you about war, that's certain. But obviously I do disagree about what Kenny has specifically said yes to. Michelle Obama has been doing a few good things in the arts, but this series, unfortunately, hasn't been one of them. Her people asked the usual suspects, like Billy Collins, and someone in her office had the fairly unusual idea of trying something different aesthetically. And so Kenny, who must have pondered the downsides of accepting, decided on balance that helping to provide some poetic range was a good thing to do. Goldsmith, who is no Brecht in mode or intention, and so I don't expect him to refuse in a manner that presumably Brecht would have, even in your imagined analogy. And while Obama has been to me and many others I admire a disappointment, and in war policies worse than that, I don't consider him a Hitler. I've thought about totalitarianism a good deal. End of Al's quote. Now, in regard to my considering the downsides of the invitation, I realized this would provide, really, a rare opportunity to put radical poetic theory and practice into institutional play. In fact, what it would reveal about the surprising structure of that particular institution would prove to be more valuable than the blunt warnings against participating at all. But I did stop to consider the invitation. When I was invited to read, I uh, called Al, and I asked whether if I was asked by the G.W. Bush administration to read at that White House, would I have accepted? To which Al said, Kenny, you never would have been asked to read at the G.W. Bush White House. <laughs> but let's look at what actually happened at the White House and see how it played out on institutional terms. That really is. That's <laughs> right outside... Um, um, the uh, uh, game, what's it called? The war game room? What's that? that, that the, the, the famous room where they go in for? Situation. Situation room. Right outside is a little ugly cafeteria. And this, is, this was their screen and their menu that day. <laughs> this is in the West Wing. Um, but let's see, anyway, let's see what happened at the White House and how it played out on institutional terms. So the day was split into two parts. In the afternoon, there was a poetry workshop led by Michelle Obama in the State Dining Room. And then in the evening, there was a formal reading in the East Room. And while there were eight poets invited to read, most of them were entertainers who performed their lyrics as poetry. There was the uh, R&B singer Jill Scott and the rapper Common, the pop singer Amy Mann. And then there was Steve Martin, who I must say brilliantly set an autumn poem and sang an autumn poem to bluegrass music. It was, it was really, that was really pretty good. The only other self-identified poets beside myself, and here's John Stewart making fun of my suit that evening on, his, on The Daily Show, were uh, Rita Dove and, of course, Billy Collins. And I also should mention that one avant-garde visual artist, Alison Knowles, was also present. And uh, that was amazing to have Alison there. Now, in terms of the institution, when I was invited to read, I was only given one rule, that I could not read anything political. <laughs> what that meant, I was never told. <laughs> and other than that, I had free reign to read whatever I wanted. Once I decided upon my reading, I had to submit it to them for approval. So uh, I, when I got to the White House... Um, in the morning, the poets did the sound check running through their short sets. That's me and my friends Billy and Rita. <laughs> and these handlers, it was great. They, they were these guys that were all dressed in chinos, and they were, they were setting up for the evening. They transformed this dowdy, I guess they transformed this really ugly, dowdy room, and all these ugly, dowdy room into, into this, 
That's the same room. Isn't this incredible? What they can do with lights? <laughs> Sorry, I'm drifting. <laughs> Back to the script. Okay, so these guys were setting up the room for the evening's event, and during the uh, sound check, our host, this is Joe Reinstein, the deputy, the deputy social secretary to the first lady. He was present from the administration. Now, by the way, he is Allison Knowles' son-in-law. He's married to Hannah Higgins. And that's really how Allison and I got in there. Hannah Higgins is, is the daughter of the Fluxus artist Dick Higgins, you know? And it was great. I mean, after the reading, Joe put his arm around me and gave me a pat. He said, well, we got the avant-garde into the White House. <laughs> so anyway, after my sound check, Joe, and he's, he's just, he's an amazing guy. You want to talk about subverting institutions. <laughs> Joe made a uh, helpful suggestion regarding the pacing of my introduction. It was good advice. It made my set flow better. But from that time until the moment I went on stage, nobody commented about what I was going to read. In fact, face to face that evening with the president, it dawned on me that as I got up on stage, there was going to be nothing stopping me from reading something that I uh, told them I wasn't going to read. I mean, I could have read something political. I could have made some sort of unexpected uh, uh, intervention. Uh, but much to my detractor's chagrin, I stuck to the script, which for my purposes turned out to be the best thing to do. Now, in the afternoon session with the First Lady, when I was interviewed about my practice by Elizabeth Alexander, who's sitting back, back there, who, who, wrote the, who read the inaugural poem, Praise Be the Day for the First Inauguration, um, I read in front of the White House Press Corps, a room full of high school students, and dozens of bureaucrats. Again, I wasn't vetted about what I could say. I simply said the same thing I say again and again, making my arguments against creativity for copyleft, file sharing, and for free culture. As Marjorie Perloff described it, quote, against the usual admonition to look into thy heart and write, Rita Dove has just told the group that only you can tell your story. So if you remain true to your own experience, your voice will find you. It's like high school, right? Goldsmith begins by noting that his own students are penalized for any shred of originality or creativity that they might show. Instead, they are rewarded for plagiarism, identity theft, repurposing papers, patch writing, sampling, plundering, and stealing. Not surprisingly, they thrive. Suddenly, what they've surreptitiously become expert at is brought out into the open and explored in a safe environment, reframed in terms of responsibility instead of recklessness. Copying, cutting, and pasting, downloading, recycling, these activities, Goldsmith argues, will teach students more about literature than the seeming, quote, originality of self-expression, unquote. And that's Marjorie Perloff. Now, this is amazing. Nobody blinked an eye. I mean, I'm saying these things. Nobody blinked an eye. As a matter of fact, when I was discussing my entirely appropriated book, Day, which is a transcription of the day's copy of the New York Times, I was interrupted by an, an engrossed first lady who insisted on knowing what day I chose to transcribe. She's leaning forward in her seat. You can't see her. She's right, right in the front there. She had a, she had a front row seat. Uh, <laughs> It was, uh, it, was, it was the lack of resistance to what I was saying was remarkable. This was amazing. I walked into the green room of the White House, and there's every book I've ever written laid out there to sign. I mean, it was just insane. The White House was the most frictionless place I've ever been. Nothing ever goes wrong there. Like walking on air or being on the moon, there is a complete lack of gravity. Look at this. This is Amy Mann and her hipster band hanging out on the portico, you know, of, 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 uh, as if they're in Bushwick. I mean, it was, it, was, it was incredible. You see, due to the intense security, it feels like the most relaxed place on earth. And everyone there is on a combination of Prozac and ecstasy. And everything I said seem to be met with big smiles and nods of approval, even things that advocated breaking social contracts or even the law. You know, you're stealing? Great! We love it! <laughs> File sharing? Copy left? Wonderful! You're not allowed to have a fight there. Strange doesn't begin to describe it. <laughs> Ooh. 
Now that evening, with this president sitting five feet away from me, I read appropriated texts. Again, nobody flinched. I put together a short set featuring an American icon, the Brooklyn Bridge, and presented three takes on it. First, an excerpt from before when the bridge was built, but from uh, Whitman's Crossing Brooklyn Ferry, and then the bridge is metaphysical, spiritual, modernist icon from Hart Crane's to Brooklyn Bridge. And I finally finished with an excerpt from my book, Traffic, which is 24 hours worth of transcribed traffic reports from a local New York news station. The crowd, comprised of arts administrators, Democratic Party donors, and various senators and mayors, they respectfully sat through the real poetry, you know, the real poetry, the Whitman and the Crane. But when the uncreative texts appeared, they were more attentive, seemingly stunned that the quotidian language and uh, familiar metaphors from their world, right? Congestion, infrastructure, gridlock, could somehow be framed as poetry. It was this really strange meeting of the avant-garde with the everyday, resulting in a realist poetry, or I, I think I, I, I'd be better to call it a hyper-realist poetry, that was instantly understood by, by every person in the room. And these people really knew nothing about poetry. We could just call this work radical populism. I mean, one thing uh, 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 popular poetry, the poetry in the New Yorker, say, tries to do is they try to appeal to you, they try to make it popular, but of course it's not popular because you can't really understand it and nobody reads it because quite frankly nobody cares. But the traffic reports were suddenly something that everybody could relate to and they were completely appropriated. Now where this intersects with theory is interesting. Uh, Jock Derrida stated that, quote, what the institution cannot bear is for anyone to tamper with language. It can bear more readily the most apparently revolutionary ideological sorts of content if that content does not touch the borders of language and all the juridicio political contracts that it guarantees. And that's Derrida. As uh, evidenced by Occupy Wall Street protests, institutions were, at least in the beginning, remarkably adaptive and flexible, often sympathetic to protesters. The modes of discourse, although radical in their political sentiments, were expressed in this common language, which Derrida refers to as a contract, one that was really well understood and mutually agreed upon by both parties. These sort of ideological differences, agree to disagree, are a given. But formal challenges to language which proved to be a harder pill to swallow. And so an example of this happened, this artist shows up at Zuccotti Park with a sign that, you know, completely makes no sense. It says, Gucci, do the dishes, right? <laughs> and this poor guy, he was run out of the park by the protesters for his lack of, uh, you know, do you know who it was? Oh, okay, I thought I, I heard you say you knew that. Absolutely. The police don't care. It was the protesters that were upset with the way that he was messing with language, but messing with language is, you know, for, for lack of clarity and purpose. So clearly, ambiguity broke the linguistic uh, contracts. Yet Occupy Wall Street's overarching genius was to exploit these exact precepts by developing what Brian Eno calls an oblique strategy, jamming norms by refusing to make a list of demands, adapting an attitude of ambiguity, breaking contracts, leaving institutions unsure of exactly how to respond. It was really very brilliant the way they operated. Derrida's ideas, of course, were formulated in the wake of May 68, where protesters jammed normative discourse by breaking linguistic contracts due to their oblique poetic qualities. So you get moves like ambiguous situation inspirist inspired slogans splayed across the walls of Paris, like Sous les Paves, Les Plages, or Under the Paving Stones, The Beach, or during the Prague Spring, where a popular campaign arose to change street names, take down house numbers, and remove road signs so as to hamper the conquerors and occupiers. The lesson is that by taking a rigid position in either or, may you make yourself an easy target a condition that Boris Groys calls radical weakness, a strategy in which ambiguity is purposely invoked as to avoid being usurped and reappropriated as a political icon. Groys claims that much abstract modernism was intentionally made weak. No political party ever thought to adapt, say, Malievich's white-on-white -white canvas for their logo. Right? Though it's a world I'd like to live in. 
He says, and Groy says, quote, the weak transcendental artistic gesture could not be produced once and for all times. Rather, it must be repeated time and again to keep the distance between the transcendental and the empirical visible and to resist the strong image of change, the ideology of progress, and the promises of economic growth, all of which echoes today's weak images with these ubiquitous and lossy MP3s, the millions of grainy YouTube videos, and so forth. So the new distribution is centered around the widespread dissemination of weak images across our infra-thin networks. What happened in the White House was that <clears throat> radicality was clothed in the nearly identical linguistic garments of normative discourse familiar to that specific institution what I spoke about earlier. And because it was fed to it on its own terms, the juridicio political contracts that Derrida talks about were held intact, thereby going unnoticed. In fact, one could say that most of those in the room were talking heads, daily spouting words written by others. It's no wonder they felt akin to appropriative and uncreative writing. So what we're seeing with much of the new conceptual poetry is the inability of institutions to muzzle those who tamper with language because unlike disjunctive modernisms, the institution is unaware that it's being tampered with. So what happens then when a, uh, and this is really moving into the final section of the paper. So what happens really when, when, when the institutional critique is so easily absorbed by the institution that it moves from a critique of institutions to an institution of critique? Now we've seen this already in the art world where performative acts of institutional critique are regularly commissioned by the institutions themselves. Again, here's Andrea Fraser, perhaps addressing her own practice, writes, quote, how can artists who have become art historical institutions themselves claim to critique the institution of art? Today, the argument goes, there no longer is an outside. How then can we imagine, much less accomplish, a critique of art institutions when museums and markets have grown into all encompassing apparatuses of cultural reification? Now, when we need it most, institutional critique is dead, a victim of its own success or failure, swallowed up by the institution it stood against. A case in point is the history of relational aesthetics, a mix of conceptual art, institutional critique, and meat space social networking, whose radic radicality over time has been smothered by institutional embrace. Now, relational aesthetics began in the early 90s as a response to the 80s art market collapse, with the buyers having fled the scene, a younger generation of artists occupied these sort of stalled galleries and turned them into social clubs, bars, soup kitchens, and month-long parties. In 1992, Rick Ritaravana created an exhibition called Untitled Free. It's a, it's a good, good, good name to remember, Untitled Free, at the 303 Gallery in Soho. And he moved everything he found in the gallery office into the main exhibition space, and he built this makeshift kitchen, and he had the gallery staff serve Thai curry and beers to visitors for the duration of the show. The remnants... Empty bottles, cigarette butts, half-eaten plates of food remained in the gallery for a month, and at the end of the show, they were sold as an installation, immediately commodifiable. But still, the work was a sly critique of the structure of labor and value in the gallery system, proposing a democratic leveling of what had been only a short time before, this gallery space, a short time before, was a site of luxury, elitism, and exclusion. Now, speaking of this show, Taravana said, quote, the situation is not about looking at art, it's about being in the space, participating in an activity. The nature of the gallery visit has shifted to emphasize the gallery as a space for social interaction. The transfer of such activities as eating, sleeping, or cooking into the realm of the exhibition space put visitors into very intimate, if unexpected, contact. The visitor becomes a participant in the experiment. Now, it's a prescient statement, one that, anticipates, one that anticipates the destabilization institutions are experiencing at this very moment, except instead of being driven by market collapse, they are being decimated by technology. 
institutions are being decimated by technology because where, while technology originally claimed to enhance the viewer's museum experience with the audio tour, you know, those British accent narrators guiding you through the collection, exactly instructing you how to view the art. Today, actually, technology works to destabilize the work uh, on the walls. The front door has lost control of the discourse. Instead of the official voice on, of the museum on people's headphones, it's now Beyonce, NPR, Groove Shark, or any number of different podcasts. This shift driven by technology is happening everywhere in culture now, from the massive open online courses known as MOOCs in higher education to crowdsourced knowledge bases like Wikipedia. And by the way, this is the, uh, an amazing shot of the inauguration of the Pope, uh, what happened from 2005 to to the way it is today. While technology, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 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 the museum content, in the, I'm sorry, nah. in the museum content and its unassailable top-down museum invented and perpetuated narrative for most visitor has become secondary to the experience of actually being here. The art on the walls is the pretense by which people are drawn to the museum, but once they get here, they're elsewhere. They're on their smartphones. They're four-squaring, Facebooking, Instagramming, vining, tweeting, talking, everything really except for paying full attention to the art on the walls. The artwork often acts as a backdrop, as evidence uh, to prove to the world that you, in fact, were there. This is particularly true for the more iconic works, The Scream or Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, which have become wallpaper for selfies, you know? This is really what they do. They come and they, and they do exactly this. That's, that's, that's the Picasso in the background. That's what happens to the Picasso. As Neil Young put it on his most recent album, and this is a beautiful uh, song he wrote called Drifting Back, he says, I used to dig Picasso, then the big tech giant came along and turned him into wallpaper. Hey now, now, hey now, now, I used to dig Picasso. And that's really what's happening here. I mean, take it from somebody who's spent an awful lot of time in these galleries. People are elsewhere. As predicted by relational aesthetics, the institution has transformed itself into a town square, a social space, a place to gather, a place to party, a place to dance, a place to hear music, a place to eat, a place to drink, a place to network, a place to be seen on free Fridays and first Wednesdays. I mean, I recall MoMA's uh, Picasso retrospective in 1980, which was often considered the first blockbuster exhibition. You remember, the lines were around the block to get into it. How different today when the biggest buzz around MoMA in the past few years hasn't been the static exhibitions, but the live events. But the cues to see Marina Abramovic stare in the atrium were dwarfed by the online presence that the piece took on. With a live webcam, the world was transfixed. And the buzz around the series of concerts that Kraftwerk gave here last year wasn't so much about the music. I mean, in 2012, the music of Kraftwerk is quite beside the point. But how lucky you were to actually obtain a ticket while the supposedly democratic online ticketing systems buckled under the demands. And here are some great tweets responding to that. For many years, many more people have shown up at MoMA PS1's weekly summer dance parties called Warm Up than ever come to the museum. And by replacing a uh, dowdy cafe where you could get a cold sandwich and a bag of chips with the Long Island City Locavore restaurant M. Wells, it, considers, it, it continues its transformation from an art museum into a cultural destination. Come for the veal cheek stroganoff, stay for the art. And it's here that relational aesthetics starts to really go off the rails. 
the original radical impulse of Taravana's democratic leveling of privileged space usurped labor practices and democratic participation. Recall that the piece was called Untitled Free has now given way to $30 ribeyes and $25 entrance fees. In 2012, MoMA replicated Taravana's uh, 1992 piece to scale right here, as you can see, with curry prepared and served by the museum's restaurant staff daily from noon to 3 p.m. On MoMA's website, the representation is the representation. I'm sorry, is described as follows. Now, it really neuters any of Taravana's early 90 political statement of intent. They say, "You aren't looking at the art, but you're a part of it. In fact." making the art as you eat your curry and talk with friends or new acquaintances. Come and see for yourself. Thai vegetable curry and rice will be served through February 8th only, and the original recipe can be found in the installation. <laughs> Making things even more complicated is the fact that the artists work with MoMA to recreate the experience, helping move the discourse from a critique of institutions to an institution of critique. This is the very last part, just another page or so. Out of this uh, impasse, one way out of this impasse might come from Marcel Broders, again, back to Broders. After this institutional, uh, his initial act of institutional critique, embedding his poetry books in plaster, he entirely sidestepped the need to discourse with official institutions by inventing a series of false museums, ones which ran parallel to the world of official culture, calling into question what cultural legitimacy means, or more specifically, to perform a critique, of course, of what Adorno calls the culture industry. Once again, invoking insincerity and superficiality, in 1965, the artist blatantly spoke of desiring status and power. And he said, Broder says, quote, in art exhibitions I often mused, finally, I would try to change into an art lover. I would revel in my bad faith. Since I couldn't build a collection of my own for lack of the even minimum of financial means, I had to find another way of dealing with the bad faith that allowed me to indulge in so many strong emotions. So I said to myself, I'll be a creator. And by creator, he meant founder, curator, and director for a newly created institution that he called the Museum of Modern Art, Department of Eagles, 19th Century Wing, which he, this guy opens this uh, a, a gallery up on his street-level apartment in Brussels in 1969. Now, contained in the museum were uh, postcard reproductions of paintings because he couldn't afford paintings. So he had the postcards of the paintings. And these, are the, these things on the right are the sealed shipping crates. He couldn't afford the art, but he could afford to pick up some shipping crates from around, and he strewn them around the room. So for a guy who couldn't afford the real things, his museums had all the trappings of museums, the scaffolding, the structure of the museums, except there was no objects except for postcards. I and mean, it was really, really very funny. And his uh, museological focus, he decided, was going to be eagles. And this guy just went around to flea markets and collected anything that had an eagle on it, like, like obsessed, because, you know, he'd buy bottles of, of booze that had the word eagle on it, and he'd show it in his museum of eagles, right? And uh, uh, over the years, though, these museums started appearing in various cities at Documentas and various Kunsthalls, and each time he'd reopen them in a very different way, adding more junk that he'd found with eagles, you know, <laughs> and I love I love this I love this. This is um, sometimes the museums were totally conceptual and had no objects at all. He did this version of the Museum of Eagles installed on a beach on the North Sea of Belgium in the summer of 1970. And this is the the outline of his apartment exactly uh, uh, as 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 his apartment was. And while working, Broders and his one assistant, because he really still had no money, they raked the sand and wore these funny. Caps inscribed with museums. <laughs> and then they set up signs, and what the sign says is, touching the objects is absolutely forbidden. And they walked away from their museum. And this is really beautiful. This is one of the last versions of the museum installed in 1975 that was a retrospective of all his museums. Again, this is the, the replication of his apartment in Brussels that he had started a decade early ago, uh, a decade before. But instead of objects, he simply put words on the walls describing them. So like Taravana's MoMA recreation, Broders recreated the whole thing out of plywood. And by this point, his project was resolutely and self-reflexively museological with a complex, invented system of arcane functionlessness collecting 
naming, laden with self-references. And really, it was a pataphysical institution, one that proposed imaginary curatorial solutions to imaginary problems. I mean, you know, and, 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 and uh, what's really funny is now there's, on the fourth floor here, you want to talk about institutional, being institutionalized. There's uh, uh, a whole room of Broders and little bits of the eagle collection is up there, and it's worth a lot of money, all of this. In conclusion, Broder's lesson is, if everyone drinks the Kool-Aid, it becomes real. Today's outliers, the unaccredited, the imaginary, the grassroots, the amateurs, the poets, all those things that began in the back door unexpectedly have become the new institutions. And it sends the front door reeling. They scramble to hold on to power that slipped through their finger while they were focused on the front door, on the till, paying no attention to what was happening in the back door. In the meantime, in this massive Clive Philippotian gesture, the whole world snuck in through the back. The inmates are now running the assignment, the asylum. And those once considered to be the gym teachers of the art world, those once considered to be the gym teachers of the art world, the educators, the archivists, and the librarians, are the new cultural elite. Their curatorial materials are the masses and their information. And the front door, in order to have any clue about how to run their institution in this rapidly changing digital, digital age, has no choice but to follow the back door's lead. Broder's trajectory makes us aware that in any extended artistic practice, there is an inevitable pull toward institutionalization. At age 40, after having transitioned from poet to artist, now finding himself with the title of museum director, self-given, Broders wrote, quote, Of course I now have a job, and I'd have a hard time of getting out of it. In my naivete, I actually believed I could put off choosing a profession until my demise. How have I been trapped? Yes, now, like all artists, I'm an integral part of society, unquote. Broders confesses that his fate is his own doing, understanding that it is the price one pays to play. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Kenny. Okay, it's, it, I, okay this is good. Um, I have a first a, a burning question. How many changes of clothes did you bring to the White House? Um, I brought three changes of clothes to the White House. Okay. I brought a casual outfit, a, um, a, a day outfit, and a formal evening outfit. Okay, uh, you seem to be competing with the uh, First Ladies. Uh, well, you know what the funny thing was? That, that, that Tom Brown ended up dressing the First, first Lady. <laughs> And I was dressed entirely in Tom Brown. And I think she got the idea from me. <laughs> of course. Um, so today has been a very big day for you. Because uh, the Wall Street Journal had a, uh, an interview with you. And today we also spent time with uh, two poets. Uh, C.A.C. Conrad, who present... If, if you were here with us in the, in the galleries uh, around 12.30, C.A.C. Conrad, the great poet, was... Uh, presenting himself as the director, in a very Brotheritian kind of way, as the director of uh, paranormal uh, events of, of MoMA, um, reading poetry connected to that you know, so investigation. And then we had Rick Moody um, uh, singing to Rothko, or singing to us with Rothko, uh, which is very moving and uh, uh, a really quite extraordinary moment in the galleries. And at some point you turned to me and told me this is what it's all about. Mm. I don't know if you recall you told me this, but it's about communication. And I just, I just want you to like reflect a little bit about your experience in working with these poets in the galleries, making works that are connected to, to the things. What have you observed? What have you really learned? Uh, what I've learned is that MoMA is really uptight. And 
that whole side of the museum is just really, really tense. And, you know, there's just all sorts of things that you're not allowed to do there. You're, you know, there's just a... a uh, actually, Bern Porter actually published a book called The Big Book of No's, and it was all directives. No, you may not do this, you may not... Do, no smoking, no, no drinking, this kind of thing. And it feels so over... Uh, I, you know, anybody that's been in there knows that feeling of oppression and, and top-down squeeze that you get. Yet here, you know, like I showed these slides, you know, what goes on here is very normal for people to be sitting around you know, on a rug that they just knit and, and, and eating and drinking. And, oh, this is just really great. There's kids here, you know, the, the, the kid that was just making noise here. It's always full of noisy kids. I mean, it's just, it's life. It's fantastic. And today in the, in the uh, museum, Rick Moody brought his guitar. And it was just amazing because Rick was tuning up on his guitar, sitting on one of those, those, those modernist uh, divans there, and he was just kind of strumming it, and it made, you know, like, when was the last time you saw, like, a guy take out a guitar in a gallery? This was before the thing started. And what happened was people in the gallery spontaneously just started sitting down. I mean, really like this, putting their feet out, kind of splaying out, and it was just great. You know, and the guard had been no notified that this was, but for 15 minutes before an event began, the whole thing became really relaxed. And it was kind of like starts to feel like the way art is made, you know. You, like, you know, if Rick had a beer, it wouldn't have been out of place. I mean, hell, this is, you know, the way that, that the art on the walls is made instead of the, you know, it is so damn sterile there. So what we're doing here, and Conrad was just incredible today. He performed a, a I don't, uh, Ariana Raines performed a healing seance type thing with, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, got, got uh, 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 one of the poets, Stephen, to lay down on the floor and uh, under these bala paintings. And they were drawing the energy from the bala paintings and, and everybody was dressed like freaks. And it was, you know, it was like, it was like flaming creatures, you know, coming into, into the Museum of Modern Art. So it was really fantastic. And, you know, really no animals were harmed in the making of that film. No art got hurt. Nobody really, you know behaved badly. You know, I just don't understand why it's got to be the way it is over there all the time. Because the guards, of course, were really with it. I mean, of course, they're, you know, their job is so dull that uh, something a little different. But they were, you know, they were, they were so, the guards have been the best. And if anybody knows what is going on in this museum, it's the people on the floor. Because quite frankly, I don't see directors on those floors. I don't see curators. We have not had a director come to any meetings, uh, any of our uh, poetry readings, I'm sorry, and I've been doing them twice weekly. Today, at the Rick Moody uh, reading, we actually had the first curator, now we've been doing this for two months, actually come to a reading. You know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like the people that do this are somewhere way up high, and they can't get their own hands dirty. It's really strange to me. I think it's a shame, because when we do get a little dirty, <laughs> it, it, it's okay. Um, so... But don't you think it's interesting that, um, in, in a way, the reason why these experiences were interesting or meaningful was precisely because they were happening in those galleries, uh, because they are, they are galleries associated with the institution, with the canon, with, but, uh, with a variety of things. And if you were to do them in the street, if you were to do them in a, in a, in a neutral space, they would be completely, maybe not meaningless, but completely different. It's the tension that is created. Uh, by the structure that an institution offers you, which, that I feel has given you an incredible uh, inspiration to play or to bring these poets. No, but, but that's what I'm saying. You know, <clears throat> it's, it's these institutions that really turn the pitching up and the tuning up really high so that extraordinary things can happen. You know, I, I, re I read traffic reports, you know, at a bar in the East Village. Nobody says anything. <laughs> but when I read it at the White House, it becomes extraordinary. You know, so I think you're, you're, you're very right. It's, 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 it's that, that play into the institution that makes things really kind of jump in a way. But then you do these things over here all the time in this little gallery, and that's sort of within the institution. I mean, it's very much within the institution, and it's still meaningful. These events, the J. Morgan Pewitt thing here, wasn't, not mean, it wasn't unmeaningful. It was, it was completely meaningful and great. Oh, yes, of course. No, I mean, we, we find it very, very meaningful. Um, no, and I'm serious. Um, but how do you how do you feel um, about this process of co-optation of the institution? Like, do you feel? And also, you, you, I mean, you also have created a Uber Web, which is by many regard, regarded as an institution because people want to be included or, or not or don't want to be included or they they see it as 
a force to contend with. Um, how, how do you see yourself in that world, both of being, being creating an institution and, and being also co-opted by an institution who finally says, here he is. Many institutions, you know. I mean, you know, I teach at, at an Ivy League college. Mm -hmm. Many institutions, that's what the whole piece, you know, really, really is about, is those engagements and people being really suspicious of those places. I'm saying, no, actually, you can actually get in there and, and work, w you know, and work with them. Now, UberWeb is a false institution along Broder's Museum of Eagles. It's not an institution. It's a guy that puts his kids to bed, gets a big glass of bourbon, and sits at his computer every night from 10 o'clock to 1 in the morning getting drunk and, and stealing things and, and putting them up there. There's no, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. There is no institution there. You know, it's, I mean, it's, a totally, it's totally false, and it's totally wrong because of that. You know, the whole thing, the whole thing is illegal, the whole thing is immoral. There's no permissions asked. You know, so, I mean, it has the idea of an institution. The only way it's grown into an institution is by breaking the rules and doing things that you're not supposed to do. And one has then become institutioned, institutionalized. Is that right? But, for example, yes, that's true. But at the same time, you do have a certain code of ethics. You, you might call it the Uber Web Code of Ethics or whatever. But it's, you, you do credit people who wrote or, or produced the works, you do not, you do not sign it as yourself. You, no. you, so you have, you have a certain set of rules, and as I understand, if somebody tells you to take it down, you might take it down, or there's, there's a certain, and not necessarily because of a legal issue, correct? Well, I, you, know, I, you know, I think like the kind of, uh, a metric of appropriation in the 20th century was the object, right? You know, Duchamp or, or Jeff Koons appropriating an object. Um, the, the metric of appropriation in the 21st century is the database, Okay, or the oeuvre. We don't appropriate single works. We appropriate entire oeuvres now. You know, very easy. Uh, you know, you, you can download, you know, the entire oeuvre of, 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 of Led Zeppelin on Pirate Bay in about three minutes. And, of course, you'll never listen to it. You know, the idea, this is about the idea of, of archiving, and the idea of archi archiving really is the, as the new folk art. And so you have all these false institutions spring up. I mean, the MP3 blogs were really beautiful false institutions. And some of them became really beloved, you know, uh, beloved kind of places where people went. And I speak of this in the past tense because most of them don't exist anymore because they were wiped out after the mega upload uh, disaster. So, you know, I think the idea of the institution um, and the grassroots thing uh, is, really, is really being fed by, by, by the digital. And, and it's funny to bring that ethos into this space. You want it, you have to take it. Why shouldn't you take it? It's there, and nobody else is using it. But you still, you still have, are, you still have to structure it with some rationale. Yeah, correct? but artists, artists structure, you know, so often structure things with rationale. I mean, that's how we, that's how we work. But the fact of the matter is that 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 only an artist could have created UberWeb. It's completely wrong. It's completely bad. You know, why are there four films? A guy's made 17 films, and there's only four films there available. Oh, those are the ones that happen to be on file sharing. And the texts that go with the films, you think I wrote them? Absolutely not. I grabbed them from a blog, pasted them in. I mean, you have to have some kind of supporting material. Mostly they're wrong, I think, you know. <laughs> and then often, as you said, things get taken down because of cease and desist. Now, I try to tell people that it's actually in their interest to keep the things up, and the code of ethics is that we don't touch money. Once I take money, the whole thing will collapse. If I touch my, if you want to give me a million dollars, MoMA, want to give me a million dollars, I, I couldn't take it and still run the thing as it, as it was. But that's why it, it's allowed to grow. Now, you look at MoMA's website. MoMA's website, you know, is, I'm sorry, but, you know, it, it tells you what's for lunch in the cafeteria and how much the tickets cost. You know, that's about it. And what MoMA's sitting on in their library and in their warehouses are far more substantial than anything that happens to be floating around file sharing. But the fact is they can't put that up. Let's say they want to put up a film of somebody, right? And I put up, you know, I have 2,500 or 3,000 films and four terabytes worth of MP3s on UberWeb, and they just go, they just keep going up. I get them, I put them up, I get them, I put them up, blah, 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 blah. But if MoMA wanted to do that, let's see what would happen. So I want to do, I want to show this film. Well, first of all, I have to get in touch with the, with the gallery that represents them and begin a conversation about formatting and proprietariness and downloading. And then we've got to broker some contracts and maybe even, you know, some payment fees. And then there might have to be a royalty scheme that's devised for download shares. And oh, by the way, that 
artist used a little snippet of the Beatles. Okay, so now we have to go contact Yoko's people at Studio One to make a contract to get rights for that, si for that sample. This is just for one film. And it goes on and on and on. Now imagine, you know, imagine that's just for one film. You would, to make UberWeb today, for MoMA to make UberWeb today, would require millions and millions of dollars. That entire site has been built for zero money. Absolutely nothing, you know? And, it's, and that's why it exists, because it can, and that's why it doesn't exist here, because it can't. Because the real institution, they'll come after you for money. You know, the fake institution... No, nobody closes. Nobody wants to close down UberWeb because, you know, I, you know, the materials are very valuable historically, but they're economically worthless. You know, so we have on UberWeb, we have, um, there's a whole generation of, of young people that have heard on UberWeb the music of this great musician from the 50s and 60s named Jean Dubuffet. Right? He's a, a, a musician that's made some incredible electronic music with homemade instruments from the 50s and 60s. Only later do they find out that he was also a painter. You know? So, so, so this is, this is, you know, this is, you know, the, 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 the music of John Dubuffet is worthless. And I found this out, you know, when I did a book of Andy Warhol interviews. Um, I went to the Warhol Foundation. I didn't really need to do this, but I went to get their blessing. And I said, look, I want to do a book of Warhol interviews. And they were very sweet at the Warhol Foundation, but they kicked me out of the place. They laughed at me. They said, you want Warhol's words? Take them, man. We're busy with multi-million dollar marketing deals and tracking down forgeries. Take the words. They're valueless. And I saw that as being like a very proper, you know, very important lesson that there are, you know, people talk about copyright and they tend to talk about it in two ways. It's either legal or it's illegal. And it's not. You know, there's a million shades in between legal and illegal. And I think, you know, there are certain economies in which copyright law can be broken and there are no repercussions. Ubu has never, ever been sued. Never, in 18 years. So, you know, I'm finding this sort of strange gray area of copyright that's actually working. Now, when my head gets a little too above ground, uh, I recall a couple of years ago, we, the, we got a cease and desist from the BBC because we put some... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, from the CBC, we put some Glenn Gould radio plays up there. Now, Glenn Gould is a very valuable artist, but his radio plays were absolutely experimental and, to most people's ears, unlistenable, a far cry from the Goldberg variations. And yet, they wanted him down. And I'm, quite frankly, I'm, just, I'm not about to tangle with the, with the CBC legal department. But, you know, they were very sweet. You know, once, it, you know, once, they, once they, you know, they... they they don't want to spend money because there's no money to get. To um, but now when, when we think about your poetry uh, and the way that this that these, uh, thinking informs the way that you work, um, recently you, you also did an interview with NPR, and I was, I was very entertained and very amazed by the ferocity with which the, the NPR she reporter was, was going at you, uh, basically calling you a plagiar plagiarist. I mean, but in a an way, artsy I mean, fartsy poet who lives in an ethereal world. But <laughs> they're so hostile. Exactly, I hate it. It was, it was. Uh, they were totally out to get you. Uh, but oh. what, but what was what I thought really interesting was, in a way, I mean, you encourage a little bit like this the attack of plagiarism when you're really doing appropriation. Which I mean, from the visual arts, our world, you're 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 an appropriationist. You're, you're basically not. There, there's there's an acknowledgement where you stole the stuff. You're not you're not like a person who's forging a Matisse and trying to sell that Matisse. You know, we know that, the, that you are Kenny Goldsmith who has appropriated these traffic reports, who has appropriated the New York Times and, and signs it as your own. That is appropriation, isn't it? Yeah, but there, you know, mm -hmm. you, the, the value of a Matisse and the value of traffic reports are two different things. And, and, and that's where the strength lays. You know, and the value of poetry is absolutely nothing. It, 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 because I said it before, you can take these incredible risks that you can't, you know, that you can't take. Very interestingly, Richard Prince, uh, just, just, you know, Richard Prince, who I'd really left for dead as an over, overstuffed, you know, multi-million dollar uh, patron, uh, a, a guy that sells things to, pay, you know, these, these horrible pay, paintings of, of patrons. But Richard Prince kind of arose from the dead and recently did a beautiful facsimile edition of the first edition of J.D. Salinger's The Catcher in the Rye. And he, play, he appropriated the entire thing right down to the paper stock and the jacket cover, except everywhere it said J.D. Salinger was the name Richard Prince. 
okay? And he sells them for $500. And the great thing is what he does is he sells a signed copy of his for whatever the signed copy, first copy of uh, edition of the Salinger goes for on that particular day. He checks the price, and it's usually about $75,000. Okay? So what Prince is doing is something that I, as a poet, can't possibly start to do, is that I'm ta- you know, he's tangling with the most valuable literary property in America and its estate, which is m- untold millions of dollars. But I would actually argue that the Prince estate dwarfs the Salinger estate, and what does he care if he's got to settle up for a few million dollars with the estate of Salinger in order to get his book through? Traffic reports are different than Salinger. Now, listen, we've been here a while, and I, th- I think maybe, yeah, maybe we, we should um, Well, should I think we can, we can take a couple questions, but I did want you to, I want you to talk a moment more about your book, about the seven American deaths and disasters. Oh, Do you want to say okay. a word about it? Okay, yeah. And um, then we can take a couple questions, and then we'll... Yeah, uh, uh, well, the the book, we, we have a book, book signing out there. Uh, it's called Seven American Deaths and Disasters, and it is radio... Uh, uh, I found air checks of uh, eyewitness views of assassinations. And so you have the uh, JFK assassination, the RFK assassination, uh, the Lenin uh, assassination, uh, Space Shuttle Challenger, uh, Columbine, World Trade Center, and the death of Michael Jackson. And each of these are transcribed um, air checks of, of people describing, you know, these guys have to get up in the morning and be radio DJs and describe what nobody ever thought they'd have to describe. What are the words that you as a radio broadcaster use to describe the collapse of the World Trade Center? They're very, very beautiful. And, and, and people are grasping for words to describe these things in that moment or, the, or just shortly after the shock is absolutely incredible. And um, so that's kind of what the book is about. It's uncreative writing. It's straight transcription. But it's kind of uh, t- focusing on some very heated historical content that becomes very beautiful and very literary. And what happens also is that the slick skin of media is torn. These guys, these professional DJs, start stumbling and screaming and losing you know, the words that they speak. And I just want to say that in all the books that have been written about 9-11, to my knowledge, not one of person that wrote all those books went and actually listened to the way somebody was describing them fall. See, only artists, see, we see things that people don't, you know, 900 books, nobody ever bothered to listen to the language, the language of those things. We do, you know, it's, it's too stupid, it's too obvious, but we, that's what we do. Let's take a couple questions. Uh, let's see, is anybody? Yes. Uh, let's, let's take a... I, I think um, what I uh, uh, you opened up this comparison conceptual art, and then also the poetry thing, and uh, this is obviously very exciting. But the question is, uh, do you think you can claim in a way the same position like conceptual art has after having seen what happened to, uh, let's say, uh, conceptual art and how institutional critique turned into, I would say, actually institutional narcissism because. Uh, and and I would also ask, you know, to what degree, you know, institutional narcissism is like when when museum institutions invite those people who were critical of them before to do another thing, to interview another board member, and when they kind of become complicit with this entire structure, and to a certain de- and so so the question is. Um, the, you know, you you put them parallel, but uh, to the to a certain degree, you know what happens. And the institution, for example, Ubu Web, an institution I love it, uh, is of course not a question of how it's done, how many people work there, money, etc. It has to do, I would say, with celebrity. It has to do uh, with. Um, Acknowledgement, you know, re- name recognition, you know, and then at that point you sell everything, uh, and no matter what. So, for example, if Richard Prince tomorrow takes your weather reports, he sells them also for seventy-five thousand, as he sold his joke for uh, millions. Uh, d- you see, it's not a question of the material. And the same thing, I would, I predict you, you being in the institution, and I'm so happy you're in the institution, like you, you get to do this and get this kind of thing, and it's fantastic. But I want to just say, um, it is not necessarily uh, the, uh, the material you do, because you will now get, you know, being invited by... Yes, I asked him the question how he deals with this, you know, but I need to first lay it out. Uh, the, uh, wait, 
I just finish the question, okay? And then I even go. But I at least knew, of course, to his answer. But uh, the, the question is, do, how do you see is there a difference? You know, like how do you think is there, can you, can you keep a distance to this? Because what happens is now you're going to go set down the same track of celebrity, yeah. culture, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, where you know what I mean. And then eventually everything, all these sheets there, you can sell them for a lot of money. I, I can't wait. <laughs> you know, uh, go, but good luck. But good luck. You know, I mean, I've, I've said this a million times, but in 1959, Brian Geisen said that painting, uh, 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 poetry is 50 years behind painting. And, the, and, and I mean, when, when Pablo says that, I, that what I've done is an appropriation, I'm an appropriationist, to be an appropriation artist today is such a, is such a, 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 a worn-out idea to be now. But in, in literature, we're just starting to deal. Do you know that in the entire history of 20th century writing, there had never really been an appropriated book? Nobody ever did it. Isn't that, isn't that weird? A hundred years after Duchamp, now people are starting to do it because, you know, you can take Shakespeare's entire works and copy, cut, and paste them, the entire thing. Of course, uh, writers are now going to be start, starting to do that. Retyping Shakespeare's entire works is something else entirely. So, so, so to me, this is all really fresh, but I don't see it heading in an economic direction. I, can, uh, I, I hope it attains importance, but I don't see the payout. I just got a royalty check from a book that I, albeit published in 2001, from Coach House Books. My royalty check was $23. <laughs> and that's in Canadian dollars. So, so you, you, you know, I, I mean, I just, I, I love the idea, Ryder. I don't see it happening. I, what, the day the New Yorker puts traffic reports in, their poetry section, instead of uh, uh, you know the, another another uh, Billy Collins, then then I think we've won something. It's it's about we still have the fight in us. We can't we can't be so we can't sell out. I'd love to. We can't. There's there's a there's a question all the way back, and then and then we'll go. And Let's then we'll take, go yeah, to, the, it's, it's, to the reception. It's long, yeah. So. Would you publish your remarks tonight with a Creative Commons license online? No, I will never publish anything with Creative Commons. I can't stand them because they're another form of copyright. Uh, Lawrence Lessig is a lawyer who believes in copyright. And uh, it was very funny. One time, uh, years ago, when, when Creative Commons was coming around, they contacted me at UberWeb, and they said, we'd love for you to put Creative Commons licenses on everything. And I wrote them back. I said, I've stolen everything. How can I license something that I don't own? <laughs> You know, I mean, I think these people are so damn out to lunch. I don't believe in, in copyright at all. And that's copyright. And I, 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 I have a lot of trouble uh, with Creative Commons. I, you know, if somebody wants to publish it, it's fine. But, you know, my publisher, Seven American Deaths and Disasters out there, they said to me, uh, they gave me the proofs of the book, and it's got a copyright thing on it. And I said, take the copyright thing off. And they said, no, we can't take the copyright thing off because if we get sued, because it, it protects us. And, of course, I had to sign a, in my contract that if one of those sources goes after somebody, it doesn't go after powerhouse books, it goes after me, which I'm absolutely, absolutely comfortable with. But, uh, you know, yeah, no, no copyright. Everything I do is released online. I don't make a living at this. There's, no, there's nothing to protect, honestly. Okay, shall we? Thank you, Kenny. Okay, a come join Thank us you. for a Thank glass you. of wine join and us. a little, little book signing over there. Thank you.